Has anybody else ever found it weird that you can find food and other consumable items inside like treasure chests and stuff like that in the worlds of RPGs? It always makes me wonder, like, what would they find inside a refrigerator? Since, you know, we never really check those. Anyway, speaking of refrigerator, I'm hungry. I'll be right back and then we'll get started. All right! My favorite! Oh! Oh! Who left the cap off this? It's stale! You're here for a game review And Honest Biggles will tell you the truth You're here for the inside scoop And Honest Biggles will tell you Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to another brand new episode of Honest Opinion. I want to apologize for the delay in this video's release. The game we're looking at tonight kind of took a little bit longer than I anticipated to beat, but anyway, tonight we're going to be taking a look at Forever Home, donated to me by Shadow Mwape. So without further ado, is this game any good? And is it something I could recommend to you? Let's find out. Forever Home is a 2D RPG reminiscent of classic RPGs like Final Fantasy. It was developed by Pixel Blade and was released back in October of 2017. I've attempted to reach out to the studio via Twitter, but received no reply. And kind of a bummer because I kind of would like some insight on development. We all know that I am not a very big indie game person, and I don't know if there are more people out there like me, but I always find AAA games to be more of a safe zone, even though they're more expensive and oftentimes littered with microtransactions. I know, people like me make it harder for independent developers to get noticed, but honestly, I don't find this mentality to be unreasonable. Forever Home, like most indie games, was developed by a small group of people. The mastermind behind this project is a man named David Hunt. I've tried reaching out to him as well for any comments regarding the game, but to no avail. I want to go on record by saying that this review has been a nightmare to put together. Not only are there no assets anywhere on the internet, but looking for a descriptive walkthrough was challenging as well. Luckily, I was able to find one Let's Play on the internet from a small YouTuber named Bugfragged. So for those who decide they want to pick up this game for themselves, I recommend checking out his Let's Play. It just might make the game easier for you. One thing that I was able to find on the internet for this game is a plot summary from the developer himself. So, out of respect to him, I'm going to read his words because I think that he can explain the plot better than I can. <clears throat> Throughout our lives, the moments we share with others paint bold strokes across the canvas of our memories. They define our personality, our existence, and shape our futures. Our greatest desire is to find that moment, that perfect instance we wish to relive forever. That moment, no matter where you are or what you're feeling, is home. After a series of tragic events, our hero Zero and his best friends are thrown out of their homes into a middle of a war between nations. A general on one side obtains an incredible power and then goes rogue threatening humanity's very existence. The future of the planet is in danger, and the only way to save it may involve killing your best friend. Forever Home is a retro RPG that takes inspiration from the SNES and PS1 classics. The battle system is influenced by Squaresoft-style action turn-based systems such as Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger. It uses a skill learning system similar to Grandia II and Final Fantasy VII Materia system. Forever Home includes item and weapon crafting, monster catching, a rank-based coliseum, and numerous side quests. The 30-plus hour character-driven narrative contains a deeply emotional and adult-oriented story mixing tragedy and heartache with overcoming personal adversities and light-hearted humor. The theme focuses on the meaning of survival and finding a place you can call home. A powerful original soundtrack mixing classical instruments with alternative drums and guitar helps push the mood. Just a reminder, this is the developer's words, not mine. As far as the plot itself goes, I think Mr. Hunt's words are accurate. I thought the story was great and the overall message is profound. The story is definitely not intended for young audiences, but I wouldn't say that there's ridiculously offensive themes either. It touches on very dark things like suicide and betrayal, but it also has its happy moments as well. One complaint that I can give it though is that the villain named Barsless is a bit generic. He's the type of antagonist that binds humanity to be a self-destructing race and takes it upon himself to destroy life before it destroys itself. 
However, as the story progresses, we learn more about him and how he got to the point of where he developed this mindset. Otherwise, I found the story to be very well written. I didn't notice any plot holes, spelling errors, or loose ends. The attention to detail that was placed in this plot is apparent and I applaud the developers. There were even moments that brought me to the brink of tears, so by default, that makes it a good story to me. Not all the characters are lovable, but I wouldn't say that any of the characters are hateable either. Unfortunately though, I cannot say that the gameplay is as good. It's very generic. This isn't an RPG that you've never played before, but at the same time, this was made using the RPG Maker MV software, so there probably was only so much that could be done here. It's a standard turn-based RPG where you can have up to eight different characters utilizing four of them at one time in battle. Each character, as you'd expect, has their own strengths and weaknesses. For instance, Zero, the main character, is basically one of the more balanced characters. He's not very good as a buffer, but he does a great job at taking hits and dishing out some pain of his own. Whereas other characters like Enda can't take very many hits at all, but make up for it with very useful healing abilities. Which four of the eight characters you use is entirely up to you, but based off of bug fragged Let's Play, I found that using Zero, Enda, Sandra, and Burns is probably the best combination. At least here you can nerf enemies, buff teammates, heal, and dish out plenty of damage. There are certain segments where the use of certain characters is obligatory. For instance, each character has a side mission that when you complete unlocks the best weapons in the game. These side quests are just few of many that this game has to offer, and like most RPGs, it's recommended to take the time to complete these as it can make the game easier in the long run. Combat works like this. Every character on screen has a health, magic, tech, and stamina bar. This doesn't apply to some of the characters, but for the most part, that's how it is. Health and magic I'm pretty sure doesn't need any details, so let's address the TP and stamina bar. TP is your tech points, which allows the characters to use a certain special move. Every time your character lands a blow or takes a hit, the TP meter increases. You can also charge the meter by selecting charge in the menu. Selecting this will also decrease the amount of damage that you receive for one turn. Some of the special moves will either require high TP or have an extensive cooldown period, so it is important to be strategic when doing this. Now the stamina meter determines when a unit, friend or foe, is about to make a move. It took me a minute to figure that out because as far as I'm aware, nothing in the game really tells you about this. So for a while, I thought who got to move next was just a matter of RNG. The stamina meter can be influenced with the help of magic or items, meaning it can be sped up allowing the characters to move more frequently, or it can be slowed down limiting how often a character can move, or it can just be frozen altogether. What works on your units may not necessarily work on enemies and bosses, so a lot of these fights tend to be trial and error. Additionally, you can use items as well, though it should be noted that all the effects of items can be casted by a character as well via special or magic. They're more or less necessary if one or more of your units is KO'd. If all four of your units are knocked out, you're greeted with the oh-so-wonderful game over screen, something that I saw quite often, which leads me to some of the complaints that I have. I don't think the game itself is very hard, but a lot of these bosses are just unfair. Too many of them have the ability to dish out tons of damage to all four of your characters and I found myself having to rely on items to pick them back up only for them to get knocked right back down the very next turn. I know there's plenty of RPGs out there that do this, but to me, it just doesn't make it any less annoying. So obviously, to counteract this, you'll need to raise your units. At the end of each battle, your units are awarded with XP and PP. Before I go into details, I want to say that I really like the level up system here. This is because every unit on your team, whether they're in battle or not, will receive XP and PP. So you can raise units without even having to use them which is very nice. Anyway, XP needs no explanation, so let's talk about PP. PP, or power points, are used to unlock new abilities for your units. Each character has lots of different abilities, and the PP requirements only increase as you progress. You need these abilities to help tip the scales of the battle into your favor, so in many ways, PP is more important than XP. Raising units is very tedious in my opinion. No joke, at the end of the game, I spent 3 hours leveling up my characters from level 50 to level 80. I had been attempting various side quests and was getting my ass handed to me every step of the way, or I would just barely survive every time. I managed to find one good place to grind XP with the aid of XP boosters, but even with this, it still took a long time. This is the main reason why I just don't really care for RPGs. 
the grinding. To me, grinding slows the pace of games to a crawl, and oftentimes, it's very exhausting to me. Forever Home is just another example of this. And on top of being very grindy, the game is also very stingy with resources such as gold. Never at any point when I wasn't grinding did I ever have a lot of money laying around. Every time I visited a new area of the game, I had to decide on buying stronger equipment to make the trials ahead easier, or buying recovery items to possibly ensure my survival. Further, there are points in the game where you can't turn back to replenish your inventory, making certain boss fights more challenging than they need to be. I'm okay with challenge guys, but if your idea of challenge is kicking my ass to the point where you are forcing me to dedicate several hours to XP farming, I think you overdid it. I'm willing to give credit where it's due. The game has a fantastic variety. No two areas look the same, which is refreshing. Each enemy is different from one another, like some are impervious to magic or have high defense. The list goes on. Some of the enemies are just recolors of another enemy, which is a real pet peeve of mine, but I tend to focus this anger on AAA developers, so I'll give David a pass here. The boss battles tend to be hard. It really just depends on what you have in your inventory, how strategic you are, and how much you grinded prior to the fight. There are bosses here that are absurdly tough, but with enough grinding, they can be beaten fairly easily. With all this in mind, I think the developers did a good job on boss battles for the most part. I can't really confirm this, but I'm pretty sure the final boss scales up with you no matter what level you're at. I say this because it didn't seem to matter what level my characters were. Either way, it was tough. I think I covered pretty much everything that the gameplay has to offer, so overall, I think it's good, but generic. It really doesn't bring anything new to the table, and there are aspects of it that just suck the life out of me. However, you've got to look at this subjectively. This wasn't made by a large company, so in all fairness, the gameplay is fine. I just hope that future games released by Pixel Blades can learn from the game's shortcomings. Graphically, this game is okay. The overworld visuals are nice to look at, the character portraits are well drawn, and I didn't experience any glitches. Unfortunately though, the graphics are a bit lacking more so with the objects and the overworld itself. You see, this game wants you to interact with basically everything, sort of like Undertale. The thing is though is that nothing in the game really tells you about this, and on top of that, it's impossible to distinguish which object can or cannot be interacted with. I think having a way to actually determine what objects could be interacted with would be a nice touch. The soundtrack is amazing. Whoever composed the music in this game is a genius. Some tunes are less memorable than others, but overall, the music is amazing. Now, as far as the sound effects go, the game is also quite generic here as well. I couldn't help but to notice that the sounds in this game are the exact same as the other sounds made with the RPG Maker Studio. Not that it's bad or anything, I just think more original sounds would have been a nice touch but then again, I don't know if it's possible to do that with that software. In conclusion, I enjoyed this game. It certainly isn't the most stupendous RPG ever made, but I think enough detail was put into it given the limitations that the developer likely faced. This game is only 99 cents on Steam, so if you want a game that's entertaining for a budget price, check it out. All in all folks, Forever Home to me was a pretty fun time. There are aspects of the game that could have been tweaked just a little bit better to make it just that much more enjoyable, but overall, it's a pretty solid experience. So, with all that in mind, I definitely recommend you guys support the developer and check out his game. Like I said, it's only 99 cents, and you're going to be dumping well over 30 hours of your time into the game. And that, folks, is my honest opinion. But now, I want to know what you guys think. Does Forever Home look like a good game to you? Have you played it, and is it something that you could recommend to a friend? Please, leave all that and more down the comment section below. Next review, we're going to be taking a look at Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, but in the meantime, I'm going to be taking a break from reviews. There's so many games that have come out that I want to play, but I just haven't had a chance to. With work and school and making videos, I just haven't had a chance to actually sit down and enjoy some of these new games that are out. Don't worry, I'm still going to upload in between now and then, but the actual review won't be up until about mid-December, and I hope you guys will look forward to it. But until the video comes out, you all have yourselves a great night, and take care. Hey folks, thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to let me know by leaving a comment or slapping a like on it. You guys know the drill. Anyway, I hope you guys will look forward to the next video I have coming out, but in the meantime, you should take a look at some of the other stuff that I've done. As always, you guys have a great night, and I'll see you next time.